I'm speaking to you today actually from Sydney, from the traditional country of the Camaragal people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to acknowledge them and acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging of First Nations and any First Nations people we have with us on the call today. Uh, it's often said that Australia, New South Wales, was the original British Crown colony in Australia. It's often said that we grew rich on the sheep's back. What meant by that is that we developed the re natural resources in the country and plugged them straight into international trade from the early days of the, of the economy. So trade has an important role in our history. But what we often don't hear mentioned in that story is that in many cases, the early labor that was used as shepherds in the fields for those sheep was forced indigenous labor. People who had been forced off their land by settler colonialism and creating the, the, the structural drivers of vulnerability to exploitation and then actually forced into work, not only in, in that kind of industry, but domestic service and a range of other industries. Indeed, between 1862 and 1904, 62,000 people were kidnapped in the Pacific and uh, trafficked to Australia uh, in, a, in a practice that we now euphemistically call blackbirding uh, in order to really uh, um, initiate a, a, a sugar industry in New South Wales and in Southern Queensland. So this relationship between trade, forced labour has an important uh, is part of our history and we still see First Nations peoples today living with the legacies, the intergenerational legacies of the trauma, uh, the reduced capital, human capital formation and other things that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. Now I want to acknowledge all of that at the beginning for two reasons. One is because I think what we're talking about here is uh, a whole process by which these social costs of our economic model have been written out of the system, written out of the story. And what we need to do is find ways to price them back in to the modes of production and distribution uh, in the international system. And secondly, I want to acknowledge this history because I think if we are going to have credibility in calling out countries that today rely on forced labor and modern slavery in their economic model, it's crucial that we acknowledge that we have made those mistakes in the past and that we recognize and even enumerate the, the lost economic income, the, the negative social impacts that have resulted from our mistakes in the past. There's no reason that countries today moving up the development curve need to re repeat our mistakes of the past. Next slide, please. So as uh, Sarah mentioned, uh, I'm speaking to you. I'm now the New South Wales Anti-Slavery Commissioner, an independent statutory office appointed by uh, the Governor of New South Wales, a representative of the Crown. Um, my mandate in that role, I should be very clear, does include advocacy for action to address modern slavery, particularly around identifying and addressing modern slavery risk in supply chains, but it is not a foreign policy mandate. New South Wales is a subnational entity. It doesn't have foreign policy powers in Australia. That's at the federal level. So nothing I say here is should be uh, seen as speaking for the Australian or the New South Wales government, nor should it be seen as a comment on our foreign policy. Um, in fact, the remarks I'm going to share with you tonight are really drawing heavily, as Sarah mentioned, on work undertaken in an academic capacity prior to my appointment to this role, and much of that uh, very happily undertaken when I was serving with the, the Rights Lab there at the University of Nottingham. So it's great to be back in this forum. Next slide, please. So the key point I'm going to try and argue tonight is that modern slavery is uh, in a sense a negative externality that's a result of our failure to price in the true costs of social and economic activity, notably forced labour. Modern slavery in that context is really an extractive system that involves stealing people's agency and capitalising it to make other people rich. So private profit, uh, but socialisation of costs. Now, perpetrators and their allies use the resulting rents from these systems to entrench their power uh, in the system. And so there are inevitably significant investment costs required to change the system and overcome the resistance they have to the removal of the power and wealth they gain from that kind of system. But the costs are in fact socialized and leave us all worse off. Next slide, please. In fact, there's a surprising amount of evidence and data uh, about what those costs are and the ways in which the costs of modern slavery leave us all worse off, not just the victims, not just their communities and families or their descendants, but all of us. 
And there are 10 different vectors that we've been able to identify. This draws on earlier work that you can read in more detail at developingfreedom.org, presenting a lot of this evidence, much of it from leading economists of the day like Darren Asimoglu. Um, these are the 10 different vectors that we see. Uh, slavery drives down productivity for a number of reasons. It demotivates workers and it reduces the equilibrium uh, wage across the economy. It increases intergenerational poverty. It institutionalizes inequality. It weakens multiplier effects because you can't spend what you're not paid, frankly. Uh, it reduces innovation. Not only do workers have a reduced motivation to innovate if they're in uh, if they're suffering coercion in the workplace, so do employers. If they're getting fat and happy off rents from stealing other people's agency, they have very little motivation to innovate in their uh, business practices. Uh, it distorts capital markets because we see mispricing of firms because they're not pricing in the true costs of the business model. And that can actually lead to quite significant financial contagion when those prices are finally properly priced back in, maybe because of regulatory action, maybe because of market action and, and reputational costs. We have historical examples of this, not just at the firm level, but the sectoral and even in this, uh, the case of the United States, uh, economy-wide financial contagion resulting from that kind of mispricing. Uh, we see also a uh, damaged fiscal position. There's a lot of great work by researchers, I think one of whom, uh, Olivia Hesketh, might even be with us on the call uh, here today from the UK Home Office to explore the cost to the, the public purse of cases of modern slavery. It both reduces revenue and increases uh, costs on the expense side of the public ledger. We also have great evidence, uh, including from Harvard economists and historians, showing that the presence of modern slavery in a community weakens governance and increases the risks of both armed conflict and inter-ethnic hostility. Uh, it increases corruption and illicit financial flows, and there's even strong evidence now that it increases environmental harm. So in all of these ways, tolerating modern slavery in the system actually leaves all of us worse off. Next slide, please. Of course, the, the flip side of that is that if we could remove slavery from the system, we'd all be better off. So you can think of anti-slavery as a short-term investment to shift the system to a more optimal socioeconomic equilibrium. And we have pretty firm numbers on this. I mentioned Darren Asimoglu. He has some very interesting research showing that the historical presence of forced labor increases even contemporary uh, poverty by around 13%. IMF researchers have showed that ending child marriage would increase GDP in any given country by around 1.05%, nothing to sneeze at in an era of low growth. And UK researchers have suggested that a $1 investment in ending child sexual exploitation can deliver as much as $16.75, or I guess we should say pounds uh, in this context, in socioeconomic returns, a massive return on investment. But that said, why, why do we still have modern slavery in the system? Because as I explained, it makes some people wealthy and powerful. So they will resist and they do resist actively through politics, through lobbying, and even through violence if necessary. They resist that system state change. Next slide, please. Now, all of that currently operates in a context of globalization. Uh, and we often use that as a shorthand for trade and investment liberalization. And that has, of course, led to a particular economic model, the global value chain, which has had very positive economic effects. It's promoted growth and a number of e positive income related effects, particularly at the household level, and had very uh, positive effects, for example, on uh, female participation in the workforce. But the other flip side of that model is that it creates opportunities for lead firms to externalize risk down through the supply chain onto those most vulnerable, who traditionally are vulnerable workers in informal sectors far away from the moral gaze of, con of consumers and lead buyers. As a result, the system doesn't account for the true costs of production and distribution. 
And looking to uh, international political economy theory, and indeed the architect of the UN Guiding Principles, John Ruggie, we might say that the disembedding of capital that has resulted from in investment and capital liberalisation over the neoliberal period has created a misalignment between power in the international system and what Ruggie in a famous article 40 years ago called the purpose of the liberal international order. In, what we mean by this is that the unintended externalities of that liberalisation, which have included arguably climate change as a result of increased use of fossil fuels through fueled by that liberalisation, and indeed another un unintended uh, consequence is arguably the rise of the People's Republic of China, those have created a, a crisis of values in the international order, as there's a recognition that the supposedly liberal international order is not always producing liberal outcomes for people around the world and is forcing people to choose between their current well-being and convenience and indeed the, the well-being and convenience of future generations in the case of climate change. So the debates that we see emerging over the adjust adjustment of trade and investment regimes, the rise of ESG, uh, and indeed accounting for forced labour uh, in our systems, need to be understood in that larger context, uh, a, re a reckoning with the unintended consequences of disembedding uh, in capital flows in particular, and also trade flows to some extent from local control, as we've seen over the last 40 years. Next slide, please. That is indeed leading a number of key political actors to argue that we're entering a period of systemic competition based on values. So in recent comments, I won't read them here in full, but you, you certainly can. Uh, German Labor Minister Hubertus Heil was asked about why Germany was going to push for an even stronger EU MHRD, EDD uh, system than has recently been adopted in Germany. And he linked this directly to forced labour and a competition on values between the economic system of Europe and economic systems and political systems elsewhere in the world. But this isn't only a European perspective. Just before they came into office, uh, Kurt Campbell, who leads the White House policy in Asia, and Rush Doshi, one of his key lieutenants, penned a really interesting article in Foreign Affairs in which they argued that what is missing in Asia, Asia isn't just a balance of power, but an order that regional actors themselves see as legitimate. And they argued that given the mercantile history uh, of order in Asia, that finding that legitimacy will depend on effective regulation of supply chains, standards, investment regimes and trade agreements. So you see this emerging conception that regulation of supply chains uh, and indeed uh, addressing forced labour at the border is actually an element of a larger competition for power and legitimacy that's going on in the international system. Next slide, please. So I think the question when you put those things together is, if you're arguing for a liberal rules-based international order, can you correct the system so that it doesn't have these illiberal outcomes? And I would argue that using trade and investment regimes to do this, particularly in the area of forced labour, faces two main areas of challenge, which I'm going to describe as institutional inertia and the lack of a systemic approach. And I want to talk you through those, those arguments now. Next slide, please. So the first area I'll touch on is institutional inertia. Next slide, please, Sean. Tim already talked a bit about the, the, the way that the WTO system fits into this. And of course, that system is picked up and incorporated into a number of important bilateral and regional free trade agreements these days. And indeed, uh, uh, procurement uh, agreements as well. The thing is that the WTO system as we've known it for the last 20 years has been based on a political deal between developed and developing countries that explicitly said we're not going to use 
trade instruments to enforce labour standards. So efforts to use trade instruments and indeed the WTO to enforce labour standards are going to have to confront that political reality. And indeed, already we've seen the effort by the US uh, to bring forced labour issues into the fisheries discussion recently in the WTO uh, run aground on those rocks, quite openly opposed by Russia and others on that basis and defeated. So if there is going to be a push to incorporate uh, forced labour issues into the way the WTO rules are implemented, that political reality is going to have to be addressed. Next slide, please. Many developed, developing countries will see uh, these efforts as an attempt at protectionism uh, by the, the global north. And it's unclear what provision in the GATT actually provides the basis for the existing unilateral measures that we're seeing. Now, Canada has relied, for example, on prison labour measure, but that may only get you so far when you look at it closely. And if you're interested in this argument, it's spelled out in a lot more detail uh, in some of the work on Xinjiang that I'll be talking about a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, the basic rule, of course, is that you can't discriminate under the WTO on the grounds of national origin of a good. So that prevents our ability to use national origin as a proxy for forced labour risks. There are other grounds around morals, public health, prison labour and national security, but they're pretty untested in application to a problem like this. And each one of them brings collateral risks in other ways of opening up other problems that are connected to it. And indeed, whichever one you pick it then leads to certain procedural obligations in how you develop and impose these rules. And it's not clear that the way that the import bans are being developed would pass those tests as they been interpreted by the dispute resolution uh, bodies. So there may need to be greater attention in the development of those bans to those procedural requirements around consultation, necessity and proportionality if they're going to pass WTO uh, or related tests later on. Next slide, please. Now, that's on the tr trade in goods side. What about the flow of capital? Well, we have no equivalent to the WTO, of course, for flows of capital globally, and nothing explicitly linking uh, investment regimes to labour standards. Global value chains, in fact, have worked as a business model in a way that has tended to encourage countries to compete to attract capital by offering flexible labour arrangements. In other words, giving uh, giving uh, uh, discretion to those who bring FDI into the country uh, to engage in labour standards that maybe drive uh, in labour practices that test and drive down standards. There are now some signs of some institutional investors seeking to actively manage investments along global value chains to improve labour outcomes. Uh, and there's some notable activity not only by private actors like Investors Against Slavery and Trafficking, APAC, that I think you're going to hear from later in the conference, but also from sovereign funds, from multilateral development banks, export credit agencies, and notably development finance institutions. But these are, I would argue, haphazard and piecemeal. They're not systematic. These are individual organisations or small coalitions forming to try and correct the way the system works uh, normally. And there is, I would argue, a, a clear misalignment between emerging trade bans, which seek to prevent certain goods entering markets because they are made with forced labour, and capital controls. So investors in those same markets can send capital to the firms uh, that are producing those goods made with forced labour. And there are very few exceptions to this, even in the context of Xinjiang. Next slide, please. So. Let's come on now to, to Xinjiang, in fact. Next slide, please. I would argue in general, and I'll come to Xinjiang in a moment, that the, the efforts that we've seen to correct the operation of the rules-based order to address forced labour, in, notably around import bans, have been driven more by civil society and to some extent union pressure than by strategic government action designed to change the system as a whole. It's been a somewhat opportunistic and movement driven, uh, movement -driven approach, as these things are. Actors, activists have uh, quite brilliantly, in many cases, used the tools 
and the levers to hand and sought to copy success that they found in one place by transposing particularly reg particular regulatory approaches to other jurisdictions. We've seen this with the wave of uh, disclosure and uh, disclosure rules under the Modern Slavery Acts, for example, then the process of uh, focusing on developing forced labour bans in multiple countries, and now a move to broader human rights due diligence legislation with a positive duty to act. But we also see a disconnect between, as I mentioned, the regulation of the flow of goods and the lack of attention to flows of capital. So as a result, some of these initiatives have lacked a systemic orientation and they've created some unexpected system level effects. For example, trade diversion as exporters look to find new markets for uh, goods that are now locked out of certain markets because they're tainted by forced labor. That can lead to dumping into vulnerable markets. We've seen in the tomato industry, for example, that uh, some of the barriers imposed to goods coming from Xinjiang have led to dumping into West Africa and other places, undermining local industry, and in, in turn, challenging the ability to create a political coalition that supports these kinds of measures. And we even see cross subsidy of slave made goods, as I'll explain uh, a little bit more in a moment. Next slide, please. So I think Xinjiang is a really interesting way into this, not least because it offers us rich data through which to study this uh, empirically. Uh, the analysis I'm about to present draws on work we did uh, in a piece of work called Making Xinjiang Sanctions Work. Uh, the data sets that it draws on are embodied in xinjiangsanctions.info that Tim Masiko mentioned earlier on, which is a living data set, in fact, three data sets, one covering 324 binding government responses, another covering the over 50 Chinese formal countermeasures that have been adopted, uh, and another covering uh, several thousand corporate response data points. Uh, in that piece of work, we undertook detailed analysis of the dynamics of measures in different sectors, including notably the cotton, tomato, and solar sectors. And I think what we see is that there's a fairly piecemeal approach here that hasn't been informed in design and execution by lessons from sanctions theory or indeed trade theory. Next slide, please. So I'll just pull out some of the key uh, findings from that work about how the approach we've seen in government responses to Xinjiang forced labour don't reflect some of the findings uh, and learnings from uh, sanctions theory and trade theory. To begin with, and this is fairly ob obvious, there's a fairly limited uh, sanction sending coalition, limited in terms of the overall demand for Xinjiang goods, whether we think of that in terms of direct exports from Xinjiang uh, or indeed uh, goods that Xinjiang exports usually into other parts of China for then further value add uh, and, and movement along global value chains. But when we go beyond that, we also see that the targets have, that have been selected for sanctions, both direct targeted sanctions and through import bans uh, and WROs, for example, in the US, are not necessarily the individuals and entities that exercise political or commercial influence over the business practices that ostensibly these interventions are seeking to change. Sanctions theory tells us that you want your sanctions to be targeted at influential actors in order to change the policies you're trying to change. That's not necessarily what we see going on uh, in, in responses to Xinjiang forced labour. Equally, the approach hasn't been designed in a way that has sought to provide protection to those that are vulnerable to Chinese countermeasures. So we see both informal and formal countermeasures by the Chinese government against civilians in China, against firms, notably auditing firms, and indeed foreign firms in China, uh, such as brands with particular retail exposure that are seeking to increase the costs for those firms and reduce the legitimacy and support of the, the sanctions uh, broadly understood that are being imposed. In some, some sectors, and this is most clear in solar, the costs that are imposed by these measures are actually greater for importers than they are for producers and exporters in Xinjiang. That's the reverse of what sanctions theory would tell you you want to see. You want the costs 
to be high for the exporters and producers that you're targeting. You don't want them to be able to find alternative markets easily. Uh, and you do want your importers that no longer have access to that supply to be able to find alternative so sources of supply. That's not what we see, for example, in the solar sector. In fact, what we see is rather perverse system level effects, such as dumping, as I mentioned, and cross subsidy from slave free premiums. So in the solar sector, for example, because Xinjiang controls so much of the polysilicon supply, it's very difficult for importers to find slave free supply of solar panels. The, the firms that are moving into meeting that emerging demand are actually the same firms that dominate the slave made supply chains. So importers that are paying a premium for slave free goods that premium is going to firms that are using the premium to subsidize the production of goods by uh, forced labor to sell into other markets. Clearly not the intended outcome of the public policy, a rather perverse outcome, uh, so to speak, and really requires thinking about at a system level. And then finally, as I mentioned, in, in this case, it's really clear that Western investors can still invest in those firms, even if those firms can't export their goods into Western markets. And we've seen this in, in some quite stark cases. For example, it has been reported that the uh, climate envoy for the United States, John Kerry, has been through a fund invested as recently as last year in firms that have been connected to forced labor in Xinjiang in the solar sector. Next slide, please. So the question then, of course, is what would a more systematic approach look like? Next slide, please. I want to suggest three areas that I think could be could benefit from attention and drawing on the rich empirical uh, and research insights from trade theory and sanctions theory. The first actually is really about framing. It's about moving this from a zero sum systemic competition rhetoric to focusing on the fact that we're all better off, all of us in the world are better off if we take the steps to eliminate modern slavery from the global production and distribution system. So back to those basic learnings about the sustainable development impacts of eradicating modern slavery. We need to make the case to relevant businesses and indeed relevant governments that while there are costs, short term costs for upgrading their production systems, their supply chains, their value chains to move away from reliance on coercion in the workplace. We're all going to be better off them included if we incur those costs. But we should also have policy frameworks in place to address those costs. So we should be, for example, subsidizing that kind of supply chain upgrading. We should be creating commercial incentives, for example, through public procurement to encourage that. We should use industrial policy to make sure, for example, there is rapid access to truly slave free polysilicon in the solar panel supply chain. We know that the solar supply chain is highly responsible, responsive to tariffs and industrial policy, but we simply haven't deployed it at transnational scale yet to address this problem. We haven't used public procurement to address this problem. We're only just now beginning to use public investment and export finance, and the move to do so is coming from within those agencies, not from legislators and public policymakers more broadly. Next slide, please. The second way I think we could take a more systematic approach is to recognize that we need to embed anti-slavery as a goal across the system. We can't expect to move the economic system by pulling one lever alone, namely uh, trade and customs controls. We have to bring capital flows into this discussion. And again, that can't just be done by individual institutional investors or even voluntary uh, vanguard coalitions. We need to use regulatory power to price this into, uh, into the cost of capital. That requires a step change, I think, in access to reliable, scalable, firm level forced labor risk information. But we're unlikely to see that emerge out of the market unless the standards require it. The ESG reporting standards, the SEC disclosure rules, uh, and similar arrangements in the EU. So I would argue that a big focus should be in years ahead on getting forced labor and modern slavery 
into those ISSB discussions, into those discussions going on right now around sustainable finance reporting uh, standards and expectations, or we risk missing the boat on this. Next slide, please. The third and final area I would suggest is that Xinjiang is really a critical test and a critical opportunity to move this approach forward. We know that risks relating to Xinjiang forced labour can't be effectively identified and managed by individual businesses, in part because of conditions on the ground in China. We need a collective action approach involving not only industry along value chains, but also the governments along the value chain, civil society, and indeed investors. But we haven't yet invested in the infrastructure for collective action. We've got unilateral action by a number of actors, which is seeking to align, including in around target selection, but we don't have collective frameworks for value chain mapping, for information sharing at scale, down to the firm level with relevant businesses, for risk signaling, when is a particular supplier or a particular commodity high risk, uh, or for example, around mutual debarment arrangements. And we haven't even begun to think about collective approaches to remedy in this context. Now, the EU forced labour uh, instrument is going to be an important driver of these discussions, not least the way it leans in around remedy. But we need to connect that intergovernmental approach within the EU context up to other governments and to industry elsewhere. And we do have certain elements that we could build on. For example, the call, UK's call to action, uh, public procurement principles, which were signed up to by the five countries we know as the Five Eyes, uh, could be a framework for collaboration uh, amongst public procurement entities around this kind of approach. But that work uh, needs to square, for example, with the WTO agreement on government procurement, which largely tracks the GATT and doesn't offer a clear basis for using uh, national or regional origin as a proxy for enforcing labour standards. There's work required here, real public policy and legal analysis required to retool the rules-based international order to ensure we're not promoting modern slavery, but actually offend, effectively preventing it. Similarly, we see really interesting action emerging from certain multilateral development banks around a common approach to tackling forced labour risks in Xinjiang. But again, we shouldn't be relying on individual investors, even if they have governmental links to drive this. It needs to be a public policy discussion. It needs to be a systematic approach if we want to see system level effects. Ultimately, I would suggest to you, modern slavery is a system failure. We operate in a globalised system in our contemporary economy. We have to address this at global scale. If we want to see the UK's leverage brought to bear on some of the most acute modern slavery risks in the Indo-Pacific and in the world today, this, these are really important entry points. And I look forward to seeing the results of the discussion uh, over the next two days. Thank you so much.